So our next speaker, Obi Felton, is responsible for getting early stage X projects out of the lab and into the real world, or ensuring they fail fast. Previously, she was director of consumer marketing for Google in Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Before Google, Obi launched the e-commerce business of a major UK retailer, worked as a strategy consultant, and led eToy.com's unsuccessful expansion to Germany during the first dot-com era. She set up Campus, a Google-funded space for London tech entrepreneurs. Obi served on the board of Springer Nature, a global academic and educational publisher, the Wellcome Trust Mental Health Priority Area, BFB Labs, a social tech startup designing digital interventions to improve youth mental health, and on the interim board setting up the Healthy Brain Go Global Initiative. She's also a trustee of SHIFT, a charity tackling social problems through the power of design thinking and social ventures. Obi has a BA in philosophy and psychology from Oxford University and, um, and grew up in Berlin and saw the wall come down, a um, force of nature. Um, Obi, excited to hear you speak and I'll let you take it from here. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, it's a real honor to be here and I want to thank Justin Baker for inviting me to this um, uh, because I'm sort of the odd one out in this panel. I'm not an academic, I'm a technologist. And I work at X, which is Alphabet's innovation app. We were formerly called Google X. And as Mona mentioned, my job is to get projects out of the lab and into the real world. So the kind of projects I usually have worked on are things like this, self-driving cars, internet access from balloons, a smart contact lens for diabetics. Sadly, that didn't work. It was one of our failures because it never became precise enough to become a medical device. Um, computational agriculture and tools for ocean preservations. So what we work on is what we call moonshots. So it's projects where technology can make a meaningful contribution to solving some of the world's hardest problems. And mental health is definitely one of those problems. So for the past three years, I've been leading a small team at X um, working on prototype technologies to help tackle uh, mental health. And even before COVID, of course, demand for mental health care was growing and overwhelming supply. And now it sort of almost feels like it's out of control. So what can we do? As a technologist and as a product manager, I like to look at the problem from the perspective of the end user. And as you all know, individuals with mental health problems face a really difficult path. And the majority don't actually ever receive any treatment and outcomes can be poor even for those that, that do. And when you look at a kind of treatment path like this, what we realize is that what's missing at every step of this path is measurement to help individuals understand how they're doing, to help uh, clinicians figure out who needs care and whether treatment is working. And despite lots of evidence that measurement-based care is more effective, it's still not widely implemented. And that's a variety of factors such as burden and stigma and trust, but also fragmentation of approach. So the key question, who needs what help when and what, often remains unanswered because measuring mental health is actually really hard. Um, the conditions like depression and anxiety are very heterogeneous. They're often comorbid. And because there's so many different symptoms, you can end up with thousands of combinations. And two patients could have completely different profiles. They also change dramatically in the time frame between visits. You know this, like from when someone comes into your clinic to the next time, they can be in a completely different state and it's episodic and come back. So in this talk, I'm going to argue that we need a perspective shift in how we look at mental health measurement and that technology can help with us. And I have three different themes and I'll go through each of these in, in turn. So my first theme is that we need to put the individual at the center of the mental health measurement, the individual mental health problems. So today there's hundreds of depression scales, at least seven major ones. Eiko Fried published a great overview in 2017 where he analyzed them and showed that there was 52 different symptoms that show up on these scales. But all of these tools were designed for clinicians to assess symptoms and make diagnostic decisions. And while we certainly should do more to support clinicians in their decision-making, we also need to design measurement products for individuals with lived experience. 
So maybe one day measuring one's mental well-being could become as commonplace as measuring one's physical well-being with wearables such as Fitbit or this Aura ring that I'm measuring and on the right you can see my sleep data or an Apple Watch. And with that better data, individuals will be empowered with information to make better choices, when to practice self-care like meditation or when to reach out to their healthcare provider or their employee's ARP program. If individuals are in treatment, if they choose to share these data with their clinician, it can improve the therapeutic relationship. So we did a lot of user interviews in the student mental health uh, space for our project. And we found that both students as well as um, the, their caregivers really welcomed having more data to validate subjective experience, to understand what was going on between the sessions and to guide the conversation. Now, individuals might even be willing to share this with their employer. That's actually the, I think, most difficult trust relationship. Um, so they can proactively reach out to support. And a case study of this is Heroes Health. Um, this is an initiative that was started by Sam McLean. He's a trauma researcher at the University of North Carolina. Um, some of you will know him from the Aurora study, where he's PI. And he, um, he still works in the ER and he saw the tremendous stress that frontline healthcare workers were under during the pandemic as it was really kicking off in the Northeast. And so his idea was, how can we help healthcare workers to measure their own mental health and connect them to resources? Um, Google became the technology partner. Um, he asked us to help build an app and my team at X plus like volunteers from all across the company actually built an app in just four months. Um, it runs on Google Cloud infrastructure, but it's owned and operated by UNC, and we don't actually have access to any of the, the data that's in it. Um, the app's pretty simple. Um, it allows you to fill in a PHQ-9, uh, GAD-7, and other, um, uh, other uh, questionnaires. Um, but it really does put the individual at the center and in control of their own data. So a healthcare worker can either just track their own mental health for their own benefit, or if they are part of an institution that's part of the Hero Health Initiative, they can choose to share that data confidentially with their hospital's employee mental health team. And UNC found that the people who are using it the most are the ones who are experiencing a high degree of stress. And their team has actually reached out many times now to those who are tipping over into distress. And I think that difference, like that kind of, am I just stressed or am I actually in distress and do I need uh, help is, is very difficult to assess. And that brings me to my next topic. Oh, let's see. So right now, the way we're at mental health is episodic. It's through an interview. We're asking individuals to assess their, self-assess their mood, their appetite, their level of worrying, their restlessness, sleep, et cetera, when they come into a doctor's or a therapist's office. And of course, there's several issues with this. So one is it's prone to bias. People exaggerate the symptoms if they think that it was going to get them access to treatment. We definitely see that in the student mental health setting. Or they understate them to avoid stigma of getting a diagnosis. But the other issue is that humans are not very good at computing averages over time. So if a PHQ-9 asks them to say, how have you slept on average over the last two weeks? That's actually very difficult to answer. I can barely tell you how I slept last night, let alone on average in the last two weeks. So if we're taking an average of these fluctuations, we're also missing important data because we know that it will go up and down in those two weeks. So my argument is like, we should measure mental health more like we do diabetes, where diabetics continue on blood glucose and then make adjustment to their insulin, to their food, to their exercise, et cetera. A lot has been written on the promise of digital phenotyping using passive smartphone and wearable data. Justin's actually the expert, so ask him. Um, our colleagues at Verily um, are working on, and they're running a smartphone-based mood study as part of their baseline study, but they're also partnered with the Aurora study to collect sleep, activity, and heart rate data with their study watch wearable. And here's some preliminary data that Menachem Froma, who's data science leader at Verily for mental health, uh, recently presented at the Harvard CNOP Symposium. And it looks at various different sleep features that they collected with the watch. And it shows that some of them, for instance, sleep onset and offset in particular are actually pretty strong predictors of depression. So you can see the trends over time and then you can sort of use that as a signal at least. 
So how can we put all of this together? The vision that I have is that one day we'll have multimodal measurement with the individual at the center, because it is important to capture the subjective experience of the individual, um, but then we can supplement this with objective measures. So we can capture self reports more frequently um, using EMAs in an app. So we can ask people daily or possibly even more than once a day. And then we combine that with objective data that we can get from, from other sources, such as behavioral data from the wearables and the smartphones or brain physiology data, such as EEG or even fMRI. So I wanna talk about the, the EEG for a second. Um, there's an approach to look at neural activity. It's been tried in psychiatry before and many times it's failed to kind of gain any clinical traction. But if you're looking at a sort of more specific EEG, which is event related to potentials, example on the left is a task of a game where we show people two doors and then we basically tell them they have won or they have lost. And we can literally see the reward reflected in their brain waves and that the reward positivity is subdued in people um, with anhedonia. Now, there's a whole bunch of studies that have demonstrated this effect, but they're always done in specialist neuroscience labs. They usually group studies. So we're averaging over a bunch of people and that's not useful in a clinical setting. So to make EEG clinically relevant in primary care or in psychiatry, we have to make it more accessible and we have to make it more usable at scale. And that's what we've been working on um, at X for the last uh, couple of years. So what I'm about to share with you is a preview of an announcement we're making on Monday. So I, we had the discussion, I had the discussion with Mona and decided because it's relevant for this audience and we're so close to the announcement, I'm gonna take a risk here and I'll give you the preview, but please don't tweet this. Please keep it to yourself uh, until November 2nd. So, what we've done at X is we've designed and we've built an easy to use, low cost, portable EEG system that's optimized for measuring depression and anxiety. We have a headset that you pull on like a swim cap with three dry sensors that are set along the midline, which are most relevant for measuring depression and anxiety. But it can be modified to also plug in a regular 32 channel headset. And on day, we're going to be open sourcing this. So we'll make it freely available for anyone. We have 50 devices that we're going to donate to Sapien Labs. Um, they're an amazing nonprofit that is doing a lot of work in low income countries and low income communities in, in high income countries. Um, uh, so they're going to be uh, making these devices available to researchers as part of their human brain diversity project. Um, we're also going to describe some of our machine learning work. Um, so the device is mostly about making the collection of EEG easier. The uh, machine learning work is about how do we make the interpretation easier so you don't need like armies of grad students to clean up the signal. And so the paper is still under review, but we'll be linking to the preprint. And it's all around like how can you use ML to denoise the signal and extract interpretable features. So we hope that by publishing this research and making the hardware and the software and the ML research available, um, will help unlock the potential for some of these sort of more emerging technologies to, to uh, help with mental health research and also ultimately mental health care. And my colleague Vlad Miskovic is presenting at the Sapien Lab um, Symposium on November 2nd. If, uh, he's gonna go into a lot more detail on this. And then also we'll be publishing a blog post. So I want to end on this, which is really a hope that I have for the future that we have a future with flourishing minds for all, where nobody is held back by mental health problems. And with COVID prompting this rise in depression and anxiety, it seems further away than ever. But I really do believe that tech can enable person-centric measurement-based healthcare at scale. I think we can use it to help answer the old question of who needs what when and deliver interventions digitally whenever and wherever they need it. And it starts with better measurement because that will really empower both the individuals and, and healthcare providers to better match the intervention options to an individual needs and to measure the impact of those interventions, especially in the digital space. There's so many apps, but many of them are not very evidence-based yet. We're not there yet, 
Um, the promise of new measurement techniques like using EEG or ERPs or digital phenotyping is exciting, but it's still early days and there's many, many pitfalls to make this work in the real world. And it will require new partnerships between scientists and clinicians, between individuals with lived experience and clinicians, between technologists and even policymakers and payers. So mental health research needs more diverse voices and it needs more of this kind of multidisciplinary collaboration. And then we will be able to address today's challenges and improve the mental health of the next generation. I want to thank my team at X um, and various other alphabet teams like DeepMind, Verily and Google Cloud that we worked with, but also our academic uh, collaborators at Florida State University, Greg Hatchuk was the PI for our study um, um, and we had many other advisors that were really informing our thinking on this. Um, and finally, here's my contact details. Uh, I would love people to get in touch if you wanted to talk about this more. Thank you very much.